people of color only discussion in the main room as at the request of the presenter. And we have an affinity, another session for the same discussion for people who don't identify as such. So the room will be shut down if you identify as BIPOC, come back in here. If you don't, look on the protocol document and it has the other login for the other room we have for that one session. And then after that session, we'll close out our alternate room and everybody's welcome to join back into our main room for, a, for the time preceding that. We have a half an hour that Tiffany and I will be um, in that space just to have some openness to these potentially heavy conversations we could be having after lunch. They might be light and exciting, who knows? But we have a half hour after the decolonization discussions for everybody just to be together and see what happens. Um, so be prepared to have yourself kicked out of this room after lunch while we reset for that and then log back in to the room that you feel like you ought to be into. Could I add something to that, Shaylee? And sure. just as an assignment, I'm going to do this too, is if you guys can go take a look at that nonviolent communication sheet, it's just a good reminder of as we're discussing difficult things to maybe just have that on hand. And if you want to just print it out, um, it'd be a really good thing to just uh, maybe before uh, posing a question, read over it. Um, another thing to think about over lunch is maybe uh, the four agreements. There's nice, some nice little um, printouts of that. So um, yeah, just uh, something Did to think about. you put the four agreements on the protocol or is that written somewhere for easy access? You know what? I'm gonna go ahead and um, I can go ahead and share it somewhere. Um, I have, I, I have a PDF that has both of those. You can print out in one sheet. It's my cheat if sheet. You wanna Send Could it you to me, David. I yeah. can link it on the protocol if you send okay. it to me. I'm going cool. to get that rolling. Okay. Nice. And then back to our regularly scheduled programming, if there's any questions or comments on that, feel free to chirp in. Uh, otherwise, our lunch hour is for a discussion on saving seeds and uh, I think talking about our favorite varieties fits in with that and ways to propagate them. And there we have it. Do you want to leave that, Shaylee, while I do a few other things? Sure, yeah, yeah, I, awesome. I am here. Awesome. And I'm awesome. happy to. I love talking seed and plant. It's like my favorite thing to talk about yeah. or to listen to about. <laughs> um, I just called, uh, I just called uh, Shaylee Awesome Possum, but I got to tell you guys my uh, really quick love poem. It goes, love is beauty, beauty is a blossom. If you want your finger bit, go poking at a possum. <laughs> It's a good, good, good Florida poem. Yeah, so on, on that happy note about possums, um, I have a happier possum note. The first possum experience I ever had was seeing a possum skeleton underneath a bush with the tail still intact, everything else rotted. Um, good compost for the bushes. <laughs> Does anybody have anything they'd like to lead with or questions about seed saving? Um, if not, I can share some of my favorite seed saving while we think about that. But does well, anyone think, have any? Oh, yeah? I've got a question. Sure. I've got a question right off the bat. Um, so it gets really, really rainy here. And I'm wondering how to harvest the seeds if they're not quite dried yet. You know, how do you, mm -hmm. when they they have rain on them, you can't really dry them out very well, or can you? Uh, my favorite way to deal with that is to cut as much of the plant as I can and let the seed ripen. You can do this with tomatoes. It's a really great visual. If you have tomatoes that haven't finished ripening and it's starting to get cold and you know they're just all going to die, you can pull the whole tomato plant out of the ground and put it in your garage upside down. And then all the sugars that are in left in the stem and in the leaf kind of get sucked into the fruit and help it ripen in a much more robust way. So you can do that with your plant. If you wanted to get more, say, marigold seeds and they're starting to get funky because of the cold, you could cut down your marigold near the ground and take that whole thing and just hang it up in your greenhouse or in that cool music shack or somewhere that's not very warm and drafty and it will help it kind of finish, finish ripening. Okay. Um, you notice this when you weed pull, full plants, like if you pull some fire weeds or things and you pull up the whole plant, you can see that the seed kept on being formed <laughs> after you pulled that plant out. Um, but yeah, so that's a really nice thing right. to do. 
the things that kill seeds okay. are heat and moisture. So once you get your seed kind of cleaned of all the leafy material, it's really great to put it in like a small airtight jar somewhere kind of coldish and darkish, and they're most likely to live well that way. Seeds can so, also live. Oh, go ahead. Oh, man. So, I, um, so I actually prepared a little presentation, um, and it's a really good question um, about the harvesting and timing and all that stuff. Um, I would, and uh, what Shaylee said is totally true, um, I would add a little bit that it really depends on what kind of seed you're saving. So um, certain things like to be wet, like tomatoes and cucumbers, and they like to be as rotten and nasty as they can be. And then other things, like you can totally pick before they're fully ripe if you get as much of the plant material as possible, whether it's cut it at the base or pull it up by the root. And things like lettuce or radishes or things like that, um, they get a get little gangly and stuff in the garden and kind of get in the way while you're waiting for them to get uh, mature. And so you can just pull the whole thing, turn it upside down, put the head of it in a paper bag so it has mm -hmm. a way to breathe and just let that plant mature in an outbuilding somewhere. Totally. Um, and you it can pulls also all throw it in a clear cut near you. <laughs> yeah, or that. You know, <laughs> <there's>... <laughs> um, well, just, broccoli uh, seeds is what it is. I thought I would flip this camera around and give you a quick little, this is my, uh, my studio. A uh, quick little tour around the studio and show you some of my seed saving projects. Um, you can, some of the easiest seeds to save are like pea, peas and beans. So you just, yeah. you know, harvest until and then let some of them go mature and then you can shell those out over the time. Don't forget, nuts are also seeds. Um, so we harvest some. If you want to keep these for seeds for moist. Any seed, just pretend like it's in nature, falls on the ground in the fall, ripens, and it's able to stay there until it's time for it to germinate. So you may have some of the tree. Uh, I'm losing Brian. Is it everybody too? Yeah, yeah Brian is. Brian's gone. And I was okay. trying to spotlight yeah. him, but oh well. <laughs> I know. That would have been fun to see. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Oh, Is are it, you back? We hey, lost you. Okay. I'm, the spotlight, Brian. I'm walking yeah. too far away from my internet connection, I think. Anyway, yeah. so like it's certain things are really easy. Spotlight. I guess I'll just give, give the primer. So like grains, beans, uh, peas, uh, corn, will outcross but corn is a, like a really easy seed to clean and stuff other seeds are much harder like lettuce so lettuce has a lot of fluff and it's a really small seed and so to finally clean that seed is a little tricky the other one that's tricky is that i'm going to walk towards the edge of my internet zone this is tomato seed so there's wet seed saving that's done by um taking the tomato and squeezing out all the seed pulp into water and letting it ferment so there's a layer of mold on top of there and that fermentation process breaks the um the kind of slimy bits that are around the seed apart and then uh you scoop that off and wash it with water several times and then take the seed out and dry it and store it so um, tomatoes, cucumbers, um, eggplants to some extent you would do in that fashion. Um, peppers usually you can scrape the seed out. So and then um, there's two main things you want to remember with seeds. There's, there's self-fertile seeds that will um, stay mostly true to type. There's some variation sometimes. Um, and then there's what's called outcrosser seeds. And so those are like squash and corn, um, some of these that are wind or insect pollinated. And those you start getting some weird things happening. You're not very careful on how you save your seed. 
Um, so you'll get, you know, crossed corn, or you can get weird things. One year we had what's called uh, 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 Gordini. It's a cross between a gourd and a zucchini, and they're actually quite toxic. Um, and I made the mistake of serving them up at a meal one time, and everyone got severe belly cramps. Um, so don't do that. So squash are one of those things you have to hand pollinate and separate and uh, allow to go to the fullest extent of ripeness. Like if it's a, a cucumber or a zucchini, it's got to get big and yellow and almost rotten. And then those seeds are, are viable in there. Um, the other thing you can do is just wild harvest seeds. So here's, here's some lupin. I want more lupin on my property. And I saw this nice patch of lupin. So I, I went, um, and just, just a bunch of seed, and I'm going to put that in my seed mix that I use for cover crops and stuff. Um, the beautiful thing about saving seed is you get a copious amount of seed that you can use to restore landscapes, to create cover crops, um, to share with your friends, to trade. Uh, an exciting, exciting uh, process. All right, okay, I got to plug in. That, so that was just to start us off a discussion. And my friend, as well, and she's an avid seed saver from this area and has a lot of knowledge on things as well. Okay. Any specific questions? I mean, that was just kind of to get us going. And I am going to plug in here. Looks like there's uh, yes. questions. Marley says, I think she has cedar seeds and pine cones. They would be pine seeds and pine cones or cedar seeds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, the, the, the cedar seeds and all, all the conifer seeds, they're a uh, papery little seed. When those mature, they open up a little bit and they kind of will mature on the tree mostly. And then the, that's the cone kind of opens up and then the little papery seeds come out of the inside. I, I connected, what did I, what am I trying to say? I collected incense cedar seeds from a wild mature, it's not wild, but it's an incense cedar growing uh, in Discovery Bay here on the Olympic Peninsula. I've seen a whole lot of mature incense cedars, but I've never seen them go to seed in the Northwest. So I think that particular tree probably has really awesome seeds if anyone wants to swap some. Uh, is, this is at, the screen went to permaculture convergence face. Is that indicating that somebody is that we're no, sharing something? No, it's on you. I oh. think I was the last person to talk while you were talking. So. Oh, I'll put on gallery view, then I can see everybody. Yeah, okay. do that. <laughs> Did anybody have any questions from Brian? Or Brian, are are you with us and would want to answer any questions? Or we might have lost you. Terry and Payne is off mute. Yeah. Now. And Marley, did you see my comment in the in the chat about what to do with broccoli? It it does well like a lot of kales uh, to pull the whole plant and put it in a paper bag upside down, and then all the seeds come out. That works really well for poppies too, and other like you know. Green works well for lettuce as well. Lettuce. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lettuce is a good seed saving one. We had a big uh, rainstorm forecast for this to, to start Wednesday, which it did. Uh, so Tuesday we were out, we couldn't get our beans and corn in the ground this year until late because of the wet spring. Uh, so our beans, our dry beans were not ready fully. But so Tuesday, Monday and Tuesday last week, or this past week, we went and harvested all of them and we have them, I'm shelling beans right now. Uh, we have them drawing in our solarium 
And unfortunately, just if you pick the beans when they're still, when they are plump, you know, you can see the bean inside, but they are, some of them are still green even. Mostly they dry up pretty well, mature just fine. It's been so wet that some of them have sprouted in the pod. Uh, so I have to sort through them daily and pick out any pods that are starting to get moldy and shell them and then put them on a drying screen. Right now, because of our humidity, we have to have a heater and a fan under our drying rack, which uh, kind of sucks because it's more energy we have to use. But um, the beans, otherwise, you know, it's all lab uh, human labor, no fossil energy in them. So the other thing I, somebody asked about wet and lettuce seed in the past couple of years, I've had trouble um, because of our late August rains, uh, getting the lettuce, lettuce seed to be fully dry, but it actually, um, I picked it or cut it back and put it in a bag upside down, let it dry fully and then um, cleaned it. And it seems to germinate just fine, even though it was, a little bit gray when I, you know, grayer than you would want from the flowers because of the mildew on them. Um, it is a challenge in our climate. Uh, one thing I learned this year was that I have to get the lettuce in early. It take it, the seed I just harvested last week for lettuce, uh, I put it in in March, so it's six months and the companion variety that I also grew for seed was not yet ready to pick the seed. It's, it still has yellow flowers on it, not the white ones. Um, so that was a lesson for me. If I want to grow lettuce seed, which I love to have my favorite lettuce seed, is to start it uh, very early in the year. Okay, that's my little seed story. <laughs> Great. Thank you for that. Um, uh, I think Brian might have more to share on what, but before we do that, I have a quick little thing about seed saving for pollinators like calendula and phacelia and barrage and nemesia and poppies and a lot of those wonderful chamomile, a lot of those herbs and flowers that grow abundantly. A really fun thing to do with them uh, is just to cut like cut it back or pull up the whole plant if it's an annual and throw it somewhere. Sort of like I said that with the kale in, in a clear cut. It can be very nice to just take a lot of it and put it someplace as though it were growing wild and fell over in the fall as it's wont to do, but far away from where it was already. And you can have these wild patches of flowers grow. Some of them can even compete if you throw like a bunch of wood chips or mulch in a pile of grass and then throw a bunch of kale seeds over them, you could have that be a, a kale garden or like a thin layer of newspaper and we throw a bag of soil, a couple shovels of soil, <laughs> that can work. Where Excuse can we me, put that? It's a holly. Mm -hmm. I have so much barrage in the terrace gardens. Yeah, I think that's a holly, it might be really nice to take the edge of the meadow and do something like that. You could put in uh, you can buy rolls of contractor paper or your burlap bags or newspaper and just take a, even like a 10 by 10 square and do something to smother the grass, put shovels full of some kind of dirt, and then throw all your barrage on top in a big pile when it starts to go weird. Just yank it all and stick it there and you'll probably have a big old barrage, a blue cloud when you're sitting up there looking on the terrace down towards the river. How to get buy-in for the people that mow the lawn first, the meadow. <laughs> yeah. Um, did Brian, do you have something to share? And then if someone else wants to go after that, yeah? You can go for it and you're sideways, but that's okay. And your mic is off, Brian. <laughs> I can see you, but I still can't hear you. That's funny. I'm laughing. Sideways, Brian. Yeah, that's okay. I have to do that sometimes too. I can re request to unmute you. There, there you go. Okay. You're still a little, no, uh, your, your video, your I'm volume's a little, a little choppy, or your voice. Twangy twang, but do your best. Technical difficulties. Here, I'm moving closer. Okay. Is that better? Yeah. So, yes, I 
tail on what you're saying. I love doing wild mixes of seeds. So yes, you save seeds for things you want to plant in an intentional area, but you end up with cold seeds. And I put together a flower mix. Here's one of my favorite flowers. Um, a flower mix of all kinds of seeds that I save and I just make up a big bucket full of these seeds is poppies and calendula and priscilla and, and hollyhock and you know on and on and on. And then in this either I'll do both, like seeds know when they want to germinate. So I'll go out and once everything's kind of winter killed down a little bit and I'll just broadcast seeds out there. And then I'll do another round right in the spring, right when things are starting to, to grow again. And I get just a wild mix of everything from poppies, lupin, hollyhocks and everything else. And um, this is what seed saving gives you the opportunity to do. Um, to have all of these resources um, to, to do experiments. I call it experiments, but it's, it's really the way a lot of people um, actually farm. So I make seed mixes that has kale and turnips and parsnip and burdock and all these things. And I throw them on my, my um, either new earthwork areas or in my swale mounds. And I get giant turnips and cabbages and parsnips and all the stuff that I had to do nothing except for collect the seeds and throw them out on the landscape. And yeah, um, it teaches you where things want to grow and how they want to, um, you know, what niche they like. And um, it's, it's just really fun. And it's a really fun thing to do with kids too. And you can get into making seed balls and all this stuff with all these different varieties of seeds that you have on hand. Yeah, Brian, I think that ties into what I think it was you who said yesterday to plant seeds where you don't think that they should grow and exactly. throwing cabbage and parsnip and turnips where we might think, oh, that's kind of a bad soil maybe or, or not bad, but depleted soil where nothing will grow. It can be surprising what actually loves that, those conditions. Yeah. And the, the other thing I would say, and I've heard this from several different sources from uh, Masunobu Fukuoka, it's writings in his his book and also from Sepp Holzer, is that when you're collecting seeds, you wanna collect the best examples from the worst environment. So the struggler seeds, the ones that have like really pushed through in the droughtiest area or the shadiest area or something and produced a good example of what you're looking for in that, in that seed. And by doing that selection over a few, few years, you get a really robust seed, um, varietal and I've learned you can train seeds I bought pinto beans early on from the co-op and I grew them and they were dismal and I'm like eh, and I got a few seeds to save and I grew those again and they're a little better than the next year I grew them again and now they're one of my best pinto bean varieties that I grow um, because I trained them up to my soil my climate my you know my style of growing um, and so don't give up if something's not working for you year one, keep going, save those seeds, train them up to your, your situation. Yeah. I have, a, I have a story of doing that. Um, I yeah. bought some uh, Matosin seeds from Victoria, outside of Victoria, Canada. I brought them home. And um, the first year, I grew them, I only got a few seeds because I didn't have a garden in the sun yet and just in the forest. And I got a few and I saved them and I kept them right here on my, on my desk, right in front of me here to dry so I could watch them and remember to take care of them. And I planted them at Sahale this year and sure, I didn't take care of the terraces. I was Somehow they didn't get watered, and um, I just got a few seeds, so I'm saving them again. <laughs> so hopefully next year I'll get more, but I mean, there's never been enough to do anything but save a few seeds. So I hope it can adjust to, uh, to grow here. We had a few good comments in the chat. One of them was from Patricia Menzies, and that's to save the stalks from brassicas, tie them in a bundle, and tie to posts for the finches. Some fall and plant that next year's crop with what drops, and then it, there's like a nice random brassica scatter garden. That's really great. And then there was a question about processing them 
uh, removing the dry plant material. There was a suggestion for screens. And then you can also rub them between your hands like this. And that does it, sort of winnowing. It's like winnowing. A fan yeah. can blow out the big stuff and the seeds go down. And if you do the um, having them kind of crumbled in, in a bag or in a bowl, the seeds go to the bottom and you can kind of take out the top stuff. Yeah, there is a number of techniques depending upon what kind of it is. I use screens a lot. I use, um, if it's a round seed, you can use an incline, like a big cookie sheet. And you kind of just keep pulling up the chaff and everything and the round seeds roll down to the bottom. Um, I also use winnowing. So that's blowing uh, a fan across and letting the hev heavier seeds hopefully fall and the light stuff blow away. Um, and, and then we also have other seed, more advanced seed cleaning equipment um, that Kelt and I resurrected uh, old school clipper fanning mill where you, um, you know, after you thresh the material, then you run it through and it's a series of screens and a big fan. So it uses those same principles, but you can do it on uh, by hand easily enough. The other thing I would say for, for uh, home seed savers, you don't have to get the seed that clean. So a little, you know, if there's a little bit of fluff and chaff in your lettuce seed, it's no big deal if you're just sprinkling it out. If you're trying to run it through a seeder in a larger row crop kind of situation, then you want to get it a little bit cleaner um, so that it doesn't get hung up as you're running it through the seeder. But if I typically like radish and lettuce, I leave them fairly dirty and you just put that fluff and the seeds and everything and it actually helps space out the seeds in your row. Um, so you don't have to get super meticulous about how clean the seeds are if you're doing it for yourself. Yeah, I, I, I second that, that often being left connected to the plant can help a seed germinate. But in that same token, if you have a seed that wants, that could mold easily and not germinate as well because it's sensitive to moisture, like I think carrot seeds can be sensitive to extra moisture and not keep as well. That's one thing that is better to clean or at least make sure they're dried ideally and then kept in an airtight space. I think the, yeah. the shaft, if the shaft is left on and it's too wet, you can have your seeds go bad. But if you use them in one season and they're kept in just a reasonably airy, cool, dark place, you can leave them fairly plant matter rich and you'll be all right. I, I just like to uh, put a shout out to Kelt. I see she's on and um, I, I gave her a special invitation to join us and I just wanted to see if she can hear us, number one, and if she has anything to add. Kelt, are you there? <laughs> we can hear you poking your screen. Yeah. yeah. In the case, I, I see a Kelta. No, um, it's Kelta. Chirot. Is it, it starts with a K? I don't see, I see Kathy see Kelvin. Kelt. Yep. No, I don't see. Oh, I see okay. Kelt. Yeah, Kelt's yeah. here. Um, oh. well, maybe she wants to be uh, on, you know, not Maybe talk. she, yeah, cognito. <laughs> we can honor that. Yeah. Yeah, we can also, re um, in case there's something happening, David, we can also request to unmute and then it will have a notice come up if there's something else going on, like a technical difficulty. Yeah. I'm sorry. So, um, yeah, I just maybe plug a little bit about seed storage. Um, sure. So, and I guess some seeds, it, it, the rule of thumb is the smaller the seed is, the shorter the lifespan that seed has. Mm -hmm. So like really small seeds like onions and carrots, um, they don't really have a long shelf life even under ideal storage conditions, which is, is cool, dry, dark, you know, for all seeds. Um, the larger the seed is, the longer the storage life. Um, so beans, grains, peas, uh, corn generally have a longer shelf life. Um, and when I say longer, I mean a good optimal, uh, you know, five to 10 years maybe um, to some extent. Mm. Uh, 
And again, it depends on how they're stored. Uh, if you really want to store them well, you can often freeze. Um, so putting in paper little envelopes in a Tupperware container uh, in, in a freezer or a cold room is a good place to store them. Oftentimes I will put like a silica desiccant gel in with the Tupperware container so that it's, um, it's pulling any residual moisture out into that silica gel. Uh, but I try, and, I try and cycle my seeds so that I don't have to store them to the, the limit of their storage um, time frame. So, um, you know, I try and cycle all the different types of seeds that I have so that I'm mm -hmm. always re my seed bank. Sorry about my being. Yeah, I, I want to second what Brian just said about cycling through their seeds. There's something really, really valuable about being in the habit of growing seed pretty much every season and using it. It's having a shorter cycle of your unique seed adapting to the climate, the climate around you and your soil conditions. So the more we're always regionally using our seeds, the, the healthier our garden is gonna be. Uh, seed saving, bean seeds keep about three, oh, comments on how long they keep three years from dairy and peas longer, tomato seeds for almost ever, that makes sense. And Kelda says, I keep them in my closet and had a major weevil outbreak last summer. Oh no, keep them in the freezer. So now keeping them in the freezer, uh, yeah, and diatomaceous earth can only do so much for seed storage. Yeah, yeah I haven't and heard of keeping them safe with diatomaceous earth. I like keeping mine in glass canning jars. I save desiccant packets if they ever come, like, I buy nori sometimes and it has a big desiccant packet. So I put that in a quart or half gallon or whatever it is for the seeds. The nice thing about that is I can organize all my lettuce seeds, say in Ziploc bags of different types or other bags I've reused labeled in a half gallon canning jar with a desiccant and a lid that says lettuce on it or spring. And I might put my lettuce and my radishes and my carrots or things that I plant and having them in glass jars with desiccants labeled as root or fall um, or hot weather crops or things that I need to start inside the greenhouse, it's a way to kind of manage this, what can be an absurd amount of seeds <laughs> to track in a way yeah. that can keep them organized by when you use them. Brilliant. Yeah, now I, I know what to do with all the desiccants I've been saving. Yeah. yeah. And you can re-dry your desiccants by putting them in your oven on warm briefly and that takes for like half an hour, it takes all the water back out of your desiccants and then they're good to keep your seeds safe. Yeah. So I'd agree with what you just said. I used to keep a lot of my stuff in jars. However, and, and it does depend what your climate is. If you're a hot, humid climate, you've got to really watch how you save your, you know, your seeds. Yeah. If you're in a cool, dry climate, well, you know, like the desert, well, they're probably fine just, just about anywhere. Um, uh, you know, I did a lot of jars, but I have switched to just doing large envelopes like this because it takes up way less space, like a whole bunch of jars. I had like six, five drawer file cabinets full of yeah. seeds in jars. And it's like, oh my God, and they're different sizes. And da -da. I just have gone to the, like these manila envelopes of different sizes and they can fold flat and you can get, you know, decent lid, um, storage like Tupperware, Tupperware Rubbermaid type containers or five gallon buckets with lids. Um, and then I, I'm a biodynamic farmer, so I organize my seeds by um, the biodynamic uh, components of plants, which is leaf, root, flower, and fruit. And, um, and then I know if it's a leaf day, I just go to my leaf area and look through all my leaf uh, seed stash and go pick out the ones I want to put in that day. Um, and then I like what you said about the different seasons, like there's definitely spring sowing and, and mid-season sowing and fall sowing. So um, you can look at like subcategorizing them that way as well. But I find file cabinets are really good because it keeps mice out and it allows it to breathe. Um, it's not airtight, but you could do file cabinets with like a side of those. And I do that. And then I also use five gallon buckets um, with kind of 
organized by leaf, flower, root, and fruit. Mm -hmm. So that's helpful. Yeah, that's a, it's a nice way to repurpose Ziploc bags if you're kind of like a strange Ziploc bag saver and end up having too many. <laughs> they're, they're, they're a great way to keep seeds pretty dry too that definitely does not take up as much space as glass, for sure. Um, is there any other people who have a seed saving tip or question? We have about, actually we have 15 more minutes and I see some more, something else in the chat. Um, I love yeah, oh, just a shout out, for, uh, Kelda has a reminder there of just doing germination tests before you depend on some seeds. So there was, uh, she thought there was 30 different varieties and then um, only one of the bean, bean varieties was viable. And that's in a seed that normally keeps. Um, I, I kind of did that in a, a different way this year. I just sowed all these seeds that I thought were old. I sowed ridiculously densely and some of them um, were surprisingly viable. And then I had all of this stuff I had to thin that kind of made me sad. Some of it I was able to transplant, but a lot of it just had to be like pulled out because it was too close to everything else around it to be, to reasonably harvest. Yeah, I would say that on seed viability, it's not like, you know, one year they're good and the next they're not. It just little by little decreases in the germination rate. So a seed, uh, seed test, a germ test, you take out, 10 seeds and put them in a paper towel with a little bit of water in a dish and, and just see if they germinate. Um, and it'll give you a sense on how viable those seeds are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, are there more, more questions? Someone had a, a, a desire to share some of their favorite varieties of things too. So if there's that notion to share a particular type of something. Uh, this is a welcome space for that. And here's a suggestion in the chat to always sprout beans and peas before planting. Yes, agreed, it's, it's a germination test, then an early start on germination and works well in cold, wet soil. That is very true. I've liked doing that with runner beans and peas in my gardens too. Sometimes they do better planting in the soil and sometimes germinating them before helps. I mean, usually it does. So I'll do both. I'll put them in the soil and then I'll start some inside. And I kind of go for that rule of thumb that starting around uh, early March, I will plant things in the beginning of the month and in the middle of the month. Um, I, I imagine Brian can speak to the biodynamic of doing it by the, by the moon phases too, but having a very clear pattern of, you know, full moon, new moon, or what, what, what have you. Uh, there's a lot of wisdom in the biodynamic world that I don't know very well, <laughs> but having, having a, a schedule where you plant on a regular basis uh, is really, really helpful to make sure you have an abundance of food. It's possible for us to be harvesting all year round if we plant all year round here. And a little hoop house, a really short cold frame that is only three feet high and say four feet wide, really, really easy to make out of PVC and with something like that, you can be eating greens even when it's even when we have snow outside. Would you like to speak to a planting calendar at all, Brian? Oh, sure. Yeah, I mean, there's a number of biodynamic calendars that we've used over the years. We've been doing this for uh, 15 plus years. Um, and, but my favorite is the Stella Natura calendar, and it really gives a lot of good information. <laughs> And then I'll, uh, it's my journal as well. So I write in there what I did when uh, I write in there when I hear the first frogs or the, I see the first uh, goldfinch that gives me some, some natural indicators of what this year's season is going to be. Um, there's also the Maria Thune calendar. That's probably another one of my favorites. Um, and yeah, there's a lot that goes into it. It's kind of hard to kind of really spell it all out here, but uh, you, you can definitely check it out online and it gives you a lot of really good information. And it's a, it's a, I like supporting them as well. It's, it's like a $12 calendar and I get one in my Christmas stocking every year. So <laughs> I love it. It's a journal. I, like I said, I can look back over the years and see how things have changed. Um, yeah, there's and, a 
and I like how it kind of organizes my day. Like there's so much to do on a farm, but it's like, I look at the calendar, drinking my coffee and I'm like, oh, it's a leaf day. So I just focus on leaf stuff. Um, it kind of organizes my thoughts a little bit. So there's a lot of benefits um, to it. And then over the years, my experience is seeds germinate much better if they're sowed on the proper day. Uh, food stores a lot better if it's, if it's cultivated and harvested on the day. So for instance, uh, potatoes don't sprout in the root cellar. They store longer. Um, garlic holds better, onions hold better. Um, the seeds are more viable um, if you're harvesting those seeds on, on the appropriate day. Um, so there's a lot of benefits that I've seen um, and, and I you know, religiously use this calendar um, to kind of organize myself and create the most uh, viable and nutrient dense uh, plants that we grow here. Um, another thing I just wanted to mention about seeds is it's like seeds are so powerful in so many ways. There are these little bitty light bulbs and, and they're a, macro, a microcosm of what it means to be a seed saver within a community because it brings, much like a, a good community meal brings the community together around that meal, seeds bring community together around uh, all kinds of issues, you know, uh, food justice, uh, food security, um, uh, just intrigue and, and information sharing about varieties. So as part of our seed saving operation, um, a group of us have founded an organization called Salish Seed Co-op, which you can find salishseed.org. Um, and we are, um, we've, run a seed swap event for the last, oh goodness, 10 years or so in the community. Um, and we are now endeavoring, we're gonna be starting a whole seed garden that's specifically to grow out seeds so that we can get it into school programs, uh, to the food bank and have available at these seed swaps and maintain our, our seed uh, sovereignty. So those are all really important concepts um, outside of just the very act of saving seeds. Yeah, uh, Ryan. Build yes. Oh, I have a question. With a name like Salish Seed Co-op, is that an intention to help uh, be a, um, a resource to say the Olympic Peninsula or other San Juan Islands or this kind of the greater, the greater area? Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, Salish Seed, it came about, I mean, we did have people from the San Juan Islands and Skagit County, NBC, come to these seed swaps early on. And it was like, how can we better network and stuff? And so, um, you know, we're all kind of in the same Cascadia bioregion. And so the seeds that are adapted to this location work, you know, in the great Puget Sound area. So, um, that that's where that name came from. And it was not just to save seed, we wanted to build um, education uh, along the line of seed saving and uh, seed saving equipment. Oh, Kelt is unmuted. Are you there, Kelt? I'm here. Sorry, I've got all kinds of things going on. <sighs> there's my co and, and there's a question in the chat from Kelda that perhaps somebody knows, can, Seed, seed swapped or wild harvested seeds be used in organic certification. I know some of our federal agents are a little more uh, understanding of, you know, you have the kind of authority to know the source with certain things, but other things need to be documented. Does anyone in our forum know that? Mm, yes, I do. And uh, it has to do with chain of custody. Mm -hmm. And so if you have a chain of custody on, say, something that was wildcrafted and you then want to grow it, you can make that case. If you just get it at a seed swap, eh, good, nice try, not going to work. Mm. Okay, so if you can, it's sort of like wild harvesting as a food processor. You need to have it sort of documented, this was harvested from this forest, which has been untreated. And if you can yeah, make yeah. that case, it was from this particular farm that it's been in their farm for this many years and they haven't used anything. So it's like it was wild harvested. There's that sort of. Right. You know. 
There you go. If it's um, documented. <laughs> right. Just, just, yeah, you're going to have to have established the chain of custody, the provenance of the seed. And oh. if you just got it from somewhere randomly, then, you know, you have to grow it out for a year and then use your seed. Yeah. And, and I, I'm grateful that you're here. We have, uh, what is it? 12 minutes to share. And so I'll give that to you, Kelt, if you'd like to just speak to seed saving. But before that, uh, there's a lot of great comments in the chat about different varieties. We're going to copy that into the Zoom chat notes. And then I think we have a seed savers, seed swappers channel in there. I know we do in Discord. So let's use that as a way to stay connected. And then Kelt, please share for a bit. We'd love to hear what you have to say too. Bailey, I think we have a little bit more time, don't we, until 1.15? Yeah, isn't that... Oh, my clock's wrong. It says 109. We have 15 minutes and my okay. computer has a bad clock. But Kelt, please share, share what you'd like. We have some Happy time. To. Okay. Um, uh, Brian invited me to this because I am on the board of sustainable billeting at the time I happen to be president. But um, uh, And Sustainable Bellingham is a 501c3 organization. So we are a genuine nonprofit and we go through all the hoops. We have the insurance coverage, we have the paperwork, we have the filing, blah, 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 blah. But that's all fine. That's what we do. And so, but we don't actually do anything anymore. <coughs> we used to do some stuff in town, but, and maybe we'll start up with the roving gardening party and yoga in the park again. But right now we're not running any programs directly. So uh, what we do do though, is we provide that nonprofit um, umbrella for uh, worthwhile causes. And one of the causes that we have adopted is uh, Brian and Krista Rome have the uh, uh, Salish Seed Project. And uh, that I, this meeting is part of, and uh, what we're looking at is establishing um, uh, seed sovereignty here, right here in the Pacific Northwest, and uh, essentially doing everything that we can to grow everything that we can locally. And even if we don't grow it, then at least we are working hard on growing the knowledge of how to grow it. Uh, the, uh, I was gone for a long time. I had all kinds of stuff happening. But um, so you may have mentioned this already, but, but there's been a great debacle with the seed companies with um, starting about mm, 2008, uh, first the big companies bought up all the small companies that were the small heirloom startup type of companies. And then they retired most of their catalogs to research. And so um, all of a sudden we were getting catalogs, much fancier, glossier, four color separation, gee whiz catalogs with the same names on the front, but the, a lot, most of the old varieties were gone because they had all been taken, withdrawn from the market by their new owners, you know, all, all the big seed companies. And uh, so that, uh, that was a real a wake up call that we'd better get on it locally. And um, then this year, as if, if, if you know, it, things got good there for a while, you know, everybody's making as much money as they can out in the formal economy. And, um, you know, we all needed to do that. Uh, but it has been brought to our attention this year with all the seed companies running out of seed that uh, the project of local seed sovereignty is absolutely critical. It's not just a goofy ho hobby anymore. Yeah. I would just quickly put a plug out. Uh, if anybody wants to keep abreast of what we're doing with the Sailor Seed organization, um, you can go to the website, which is still in its infancy, but you can sign up uh, to stay on that mailing list and we'll keep you posted on, on developments. So that's salishseed.org. There you go. Um, and so uh, what we of course would love to have happen is to have um, uh, people from uh, lots more people, same people in the community plus lots more people, uh, start seed saving and um, uh, and gardening and uh, just keeping the buzz going in the neighborhood. I've got the greatest tomatoes this year. Check this out. 
um, and do everything that we can to promote local food sovereignty because, um, you know, it is the occupational hazard of Cassandra to always call it too early. And uh, so then you walk around like a nutcase for a decade or two. Um, but we really had it this, this uh, spring. We actually did have the supermarket shelves go empty. And um, all it would take is a few more disruptions to industrial farming. And that's going to happen um, uh, in not for a week or two, but for uh, a period of uh, a longer period. So something to keep in mind as we, as we pursue our, our passion is that we're also growing resiliency for the, for the entire region. Uh, somebody asked what zone we're in. Uh, we're, we're eight and A zones in Salish Sea area. Right. There's a old tradition here that goes back to the 19th century of cool gardens and warm gardens. Uh, and it's because um, just depending on where your microclimate happens to fall, you, we're either in zone eight or we're in the slightly warmer one. Is that 7B? You know, I don't know. And it depends on your elevation, of course. You know, if you're in the foothill, it's gonna change. If you're out on the San Juan Islands, it's, it's definitely a microclimate. Okay. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I'm within a quarter mile of the coast. So um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm in a, a cool garden, not a warm garden. This is. And the other heads up I'd like to give you is if you have not planted your fall garden, your winter garden, this is a really good time to do it. We have a little good weather coming up this coming week. And so if you haven't done it, then it's a good time to run out and get some seeds in the ground. The, uh, you can plant all of the uh, cabbage family, all the brassicas, um, uh, beets, chard, parsley, um, all of the Asian greens, uh, bok choy and joy choy and jun choy, um, some lettuces, look for things that say that like, uh, quatre saison is four seasons. So you can actually plant that fall, spring in the four seasons. I don't know what the fourth one was. You can't actually grow lettuce too well in the true winter, except in a greenhouse around here. Um, uh, and so, so that, you know, in the, in, the, in the beautiful summer that we have here, we have wonderful food for four months. And what feeds us is the winter garden, uh, the other eight, because it feeds us through the winter uh, uh, into the early spring, uh, into that time that used to be called in old Irish, the starving time, which is that time around March before the green stuff is available uh, or where there's nothing but green stuff um, and there's, there's no concentrated calories available. Yeah, and I think you just said this, but if, if it wasn't uh, received in, in the conversation, having a sprouting broccolis are really fun to plant right now too. They grow up to a moderate size broccoli and then in March, all of a sudden, there's all these florets everywhere. And it, I've had a sprouting broccoli last me over three months before by just keep on cutting back all the flowers that come and then they come back and they it's wonderful and then at the end of summer you can have this you can use it like kale later on in the season too and then have a lot of seeds to kind of put right in the ground for the next year yeah we have now we genuinely have seven more minutes if there's any questions for kelp or brian or i or just for the forum or any other little tidbits people would like to share uh i have a winter garden it's as we're getting in our winter garden right now or if you live higher up in the mountains i mentioned earlier those hoop houses are easy to construct with pvc it's they're nice because if they're low and wide any little bits of sun we have are amplified on the ground and we generally have enough groundwater kind of seeping in from the constant deluge of rain <laughs> that it doesn't need any water uh, and it's, it's a nice way to have your plants grow a little bit uh, more. If there is a lot of rain or a lot of snow, it, 
it stays off your planting bed that way. So there's a little microclimate that's a little bit warmer than everything else. And you can have things that you plant even later, even if it stays cold, you can still get say rutabagas or totsoy or spinach or your hardier romaines to size up six, eight inches over the course of winter and you can graze on them and have a fair amount of food. So that's nice. Um, Mike I would, or Brian, yeah? Yeah, I wanted to mention quickly, yeah. there are a couple of really good books on seed saving and there is some tricks to some of the, some of the types of things you want to save seed from. So it's worthwhile checking, you know, even if you don't get it in your library, in your personal library, check it out from the library. And Kelp might be able to help me with some of the titles on these ones, seed saving for four seasons or something like that. Um, you remember some of the other titles, Kelp? Seed to Seed by Susan Ashworth. I'll call you back. Yeah, that's a good go-to. Uh, and uh, Binda Colebrook wrote the classic on winter gardening in the Pacific Northwest. Right. Oh, hi folks, this is Kathy. Um, I just yeah, woke up. Sorry, Kathy. I, I, had, I, had a, uh, I had a nap. Uh, my next door neighbors were up till three o'clock in the morning partying the college kids last night. And so it was hard for me to get up today, but I did get up, but I fell yeah. asleep. <laughs> I apologize for coming so late to this little thing. I, I've been here sleeping. But um, okay. listen, what I want to say is, uh, yeah, I do have the Four Seasons Gardening book. And another book you may not know about was uh, published in Eugene called uh, Gardening Undercover. And this was uh, put out by Amity Foundation that I actually worked with when I moved up from Southern Oregon uh, about 40 years ago. I, I worked with this tax exempt umbrella that sponsored my Oregon Energy Roundup at the State Fair for three years. But uh, Amity Foundation published two books, um, Fish Farming in Your Solar Greenhouse, and then Gardening Undercover. Well, Gardening Undercover was the one uh, that you could you build a little plastic bell cloche. And the PhD um, candidate from uh, OSU at the time, William Head, um, he found that you could, with his research, you could grow five to seven times as much food in the Willamette Valley, west of the Cascades, without any protective coverings, except a little plastic bell cloche tunnel, which is the French word for bell cloche. Well, um, I, I was inspired by the book. You know, I work for the organization, so I, I tried to put one up. Well, we had a rogue wind the next day, like 60 miles an hour. It blew it down the next day, and that's when I decided that I was going to start doing what I call the liberated salad garden, that wouldn't have any requirement for protective coverings. And as a result of that, you know, inclement weather experience, I put together the Liberated Salad and you can see the essay at liberatedsalad.com. And it's about a six page uh, public domain document. And, uh, and I, I eventually put together a hundred different seeds. And in my research, I found out that uh, there's 2,300 at least varieties of lettuce. And, um, so I only have 25 varieties of lettuce in the liberated salad package. But basically what I did is uh, as I got to know uh, the, the seeds from peaceseeds.com near Corvallis, and you've heard me talk about Dr. Alan Capular. He's on YouTube with his greenhouses and his agriculture, top 10 science students at Yale, PhD from Rockefeller. He actually um, provided me most of my seeds for all these years. So what, what I, I got a hundred different kinds of seeds from him every year and I put them in a bowl and I mixed them up and then I packaged them up in little Ziploc bags. And then I've given out about 4,000 packages to people from 150 countries. Well, how I made it to 150 countries is I was the registrar at the University of Oregon First West Coast Greens Conference and people from 150 countries came to Eugene and I gave them all a package of seeds. So it's not as if I kept on mailing out packages around the world, but I did give them out for about 35 years. I gave them out to everybody who wanted them. And so I spread this whole idea of what's called the mesclun or the uh, green salad, but I call it liberated salad. 
So what I was going to suggest for like maybe the next convergence or maybe tomorrow or something is we could have people kind of throw out in their regions what the best cultivars are in their experience. Because ultimately where I want to take a liberated salad is to um, have 10 different zones in our country, which has changed radically since the liberated salad started about 35 years ago have different zones develop their own seed packages and then have little collectives of people around the country get these out to people to garden with. And so that's kind of one, one of my five goals left in my life before I died. I'm sort of passing that on to you because I'm an older person and I may not accomplish it. Kathy, thank you for your long service in service of the seeds. Thank you for your wonderful spirit. That's a great project. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Oh, Chaley, yeah. is there Sorry, a I was muted. The liberated lettuce is awesome. And we have another session that's starting now in our room that we need to be mindful of. And, uh, okay. Well, I have to go back to work in the formal economy. And besides cleaning up the chaos of homesteading uh, in this particular season of the year. So I will, I will see you uh, another time. And uh, feel free, you can... Uh, Feel free to contact me. I'm uh, not too hard to find because I'm actually in the phone book, a landline, that's my office line, under my real name. And so if you want to get a hold of me, it's not too hard. So just leave Great. a message and I'll get that's back to you when I can. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. And um, so we're going to close this room and everybody is going to be gone out. And then you can re-log back into one of two rooms. And I don't know if Cassie or David have the protocol doc and we could paste the other room in the chat it's, before we go, or do you have it? You want me to type yeah. it for you? Yeah, I can't Brian, paste it on my phone. <laughs> I can paste it. I got it covered. Yeah. Brian, yeah. maybe at another- and thank you, Kelp, for joining us. Yeah, hold on a second. I want to say something to Brian. Um, maybe we can do, uh, use this to launch a little virtual seed swap uh, because um, uh, we've still got some uh, uh, local heirlooms that uh, I'm perfectly happy to um, share out if somebody else helps me with the logistics. Yeah. Hey, uh, so, Kelsey, I have a seed thread in the Slack. There, there's oh, there's one in Discord, and we'll add one in Slack, but we can definitely okay. do seed savers in both. Oh, Perfect. Okay. I, I don't know how to use any of that fancy stuff. Um, I'm okay with Zooming because I teach college. But uh, uh, all right. Love yeah, and thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us. You take care. Yeah, we have a few minutes to transition, but I don't want it to be too stark, so it's good to get ready. Thank you for, for the time and being gracious with the, we got to watch it. <laughs> thank you. All fine. It's all fine. Thank you, Brian, for inviting me. All right. Thanks, Shelly. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And Shaylee, and so, I think maybe we need to like explain a little bit in details because I'm not actually following it myself. Um, okay, so. so following this session, we have a decolonizing permaculture discussion. <laughs> and as the, and the request from the presenter was that we have a BIPOC only discussion. And as such, this is our main room where that is not all of how we are represented. And we are dividing our group into two different sessions. There's the decolonization discussion for those who are in the BIPOC only group. And then everybody else who doesn't associate with that can have the same discussion in another room. And so that other room's information is being posted into the chat right now. And, and I'm gonna go ahead and go open that channel so that people can go ahead and join. Great, way, can you, right can now, you, you can paste join. the login information into the chat and then open the room for us? I um, think we're so, gonna paste it. I can, yeah. I can go ahead and paste it, but um, so room number one is for BIPOC only. That's right, which is room this number room. Two. Yes. And the nice thing about having this room be that room is it's, it's our main room and we're holding that space. <laughs> After our session and the other room closes, we are welcome to come back in this space where Tiffany, uh, one of our organizers and a co-facilitator of the BIPOC only discussion will be in that discussion and then in the open space we've created after the decolonizing permaculture discussion. So after this, I think we have 75 minutes for the kind of 
two spaces to discuss it. And then we have a half hour where it's open for all of us to come together. And I know having this getting kicked out of the room might make a lot of us feel uncomfortable or why does it have to be that way? Why do we need separate spaces? And we have the forum of this next session to deal with that if it's something you would like to talk about. But part of it is just respecting that space for being able to talk about our experiences and hurt it with people who have experienced perhaps similar things. I likened it to Julie as being a, having been exposed to some amount of sexual violence, if I wanted to have a share session with other women about that and men wanted to be in the room, I might feel uncomfortable. And so in that light, if someone wants a closed room of people who have a shared body to talk about things of maybe violence they've experienced because of their body, I think it's good to honor that. And so as a board, we've chosen to have a one exception to our one room rule for this hour. And if you'd like to email the board or use our feedback channel or any of the comments in Slack, we're happy to get into a discussion about that. But right now is not the place to discuss that because we have another session to get to and we want to honor everybody's time. So thank you for caring and thinking and having all these feelings and I really care about them. Please email us or write us and I hope to see you in 75 minutes when we can all come back into this room and have time together as a whole community. That's what it's about, ways for us to come thank together you. and feel good about it. So goodbye, we're all leaving. The information is in the chat right now. So copy that into your browser or get yeah, it from it the protocol gone. document. Because we gotta close yeah. the room. Yeah, I'm gonna close, right. I'm gonna officially close it in 60 seconds. All right, so copy it. It's in the protocol, which you've been emailed. I don't want to lose anybody who got the protocol doc or copied it. It's in Slack, it, you've been emailed the protocol, and I will put it on the schedule right now too. So it'll, mom it'll be available on our schedule for a little bit. <laughs> or Cassie can paste it into the schedule in this hour if I can't get to it fast enough because it's not on my screen. Okay, thank you everyone.